Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. This is going to be a real fun one because we're going to talk to Al Sutton. Al Sutton is a producer, an engineer, a mixer, studio owner, all in Detroit. And he makes rather amazing gear. He makes the Acme Motown DI that I use on every single recording. He also did all of those incredible Helios mic pre's and EQs. And he's just an all around great guy. So this is going to be a fun conversation. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Sitting here with the rather wonderful Mr. Al Sutton. How the devil are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, I think anybody who's ever watched knows that we use your Acme Motown DI. And I've, I've got a lot of DIs that have transformers in it. Let's be honest. And that's sort of becoming a you know a standard thing for people to do. Stick a transformer in it. But first of all, your DI, which is sitting under the console here, weighs a crap ton for a little thing, meaning it must have a rather large transformer in that. The way that it runs down is one day I was doing a recording session with Dennis Coffey, who was one of the original Funk Brothers. And he had this little box, little home-built box. And I'm like, what the hell is that? He's like, oh, it's, I don't use an amp. I just use a box. You know? And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, we never did at Motown. You know, I did a little research on it and tracked down the guy who built it for him, who was this guy, Ed Wolfram. And he informed me what the Transformer was. And I'm like, it's pretty amazing. Tried a bunch, tried every Transformer I could get my hands on. Nothing could come close to that original Transformer. So eventually I had to just badger the manufacturer to make it again for me. And it took, that took probably over a year to just finally say, all right, well, if you, you know, we'll do it if you just stop bugging us, you know? And, and they started making them and, you know, it's, now it's just moving. We sold probably over 1,500 of those things. And they're, I think they're happy they did it, you know? No, it's absolutely incredible. It's got so much weight. It's flat is what it is. Really? It's not I wouldn't say that it's got weight because it doesn't add any low end. It, on a computer curve, it's flat as a pancake. But I think what you're hearing is it just has no saturation in the low end. So you get all that low frequency through the unit and, you know, into your computer or into your mic preamp without the transformer compressing it out, you know, and oversaturating it and losing the low end, you know, so that's kind of what happens a lot. Ah, interesting. So by the perceived increase in low end, it's the fact that it's not decreasing it is what I'm hearing. Exactly. Yeah, it's just flat. And I think it's probably the most natural sound of the pickup you can get out of an input device, especially on passive instruments, which it's designed for. It's got a 50K input. Keating. So you plug that in an old Fender bass or an old guitar, and it's those are roughly in that range, you know, the, the 50, 60 you know, K impeding. So it, it just kind of, it's a match made in heaven, you know? So. Yeah. No, it's absolutely fantastic. Now you have a tube version of it as well. What did you do uh, differently for the tube? So the tube unit is the actual box that's down at Motown. I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of it. It's like a six five channel like rack unit that sits right next to the stairs up against the wall and it has five knobs on it which are actually a mixer and everybody would plug into that they would have to just blend their levels off of a little 12 inch coaxial with a 30 watt amp and that would be all the volume you could get for like the string you know the bass player and the guitar players all shared that input and they built that unit just to streamline their whole process there at Motown that was built by Mike McLean who was a very important mentor to me who just passed away actually in November. That was a thing they needed to do because they wanted to in increase the time moving, you know, the sessions along, no setup time. So what they, he came up with was a, an instrument to line amplifier. So it's, it's a tube DI and a tube mic preamp all in one end. So the front end is a tube DI, then it has a mic gain on the back end that, you know, a line amp that bumps it up the line level. And he set all the levels internally inside of it. The musicians only had to plug in and make sure that their instrument wasn't going over zero on the VU meter. And it went direct to patch points and direct into tape. And that was how they did it. So it's a pretty clever box. And we do that one now too, which is, I got one right here. Oh, this is what it is right here. It's called the MTP66. I'll try to hold it steady. But we brought the knobs out to the front. You know, we put an output fader on it and we brought the input gain so musicians now can just play with it. And on top of that, we added like a mic input so you can run a microphone, which the mic amp itself is also an actual Motown original design that they had for some of their stationary microphone, you know, their stationary mic amps that they had built. Just a single pentode, very simple fixed gain mic pre works really well. You have to try it. I, I have to send you one. I know. Send me one. I, I'm surprised <laughs> you, you don't have it. You know? <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> you didn't even ask for it. I well, I guess I haven't seen you in a while. I know. Well, you know what? There's a, there's a nice space up here. It yeah. would look good up there. I, I, admit. Good there. I saw you comment on my uh, Dave Way photo with the Motown EQs that he has. Mm -hmm. I got a pair of those original ones as well in my studio. And I've been working on actually making that for the next Acme product. The Helios thing has really kind of detoured me for the last 18 months. And um, now that we're in production and stuff and all the R&D is done, I've been sliding back into that. That is an insanely complicated circuit to build. Very musical, the, the cleanest, no phase shift equalizer I've ever heard. And they do have a thing, you know, they're not, they're not for everybody, you know, I don't think, you know, but... You throw those on like some snares and some vocals and it it does have that sort of reminiscence of some of that Motown stuff because that's all they had for their equalizers. You know, they had what, 40, 46 of those? 48. 48 ever made, I think, is the number. And um, so they, you know, eight track machines, eight of those EQs, one on every track that when they mix, that's how they did it, you know? It's, um, how, how would you describe it? It's an equalizer that you cannot over EQ anything with. It's so subtle, you know? because it's all passive. So. You just mentioned Helios. Give us a little rundown of, of what you've been making. So we are, I got one right here. We, we've we reissued the original 0011, which is the original Helios part number, but everybody seems to call it Type 69 from the 2000s era Tony Arnold, but technically the real name was 0011. That's what Helios called it. I don't have any knob caps on this one yet because it's still a photo. But we've reissued this and we went, to 1970 era it's got a luster phone in it but it has like the the most popular like there was a few of them that were issued really early it had slightly different low frequency points and but nobody really ever sees those modules so we went to the other one the next generation on that but we went and reissued it with the original buyer dynamic or um it had a buyer dynamic for most of these modules production but the luster phone was an earlier transformer that was pretty amazing sounding so we we got a hold of an original one of those and we had it reverse engineered so we have those and these in this particular module and we also added the helios makeup gain amplifier into the module itself so it doesn't have that issue that most of them have that you know that you can't drive anything you know under 10k with them like the reissue ones from the 2000s they didn't have a line amp on them so no transformer out, so they distorted it really quickly. They had no gain. They couldn't drive a 600 ohm load. They couldn't drive a 5K load, really, for that much. So these have plenty of output. They're perfectly gained upright. And we, we spent 18 months meticulously, you know, making sure these match the six original ones that we have here in the studio. So it was a lot of work. You know, the EQ points are right on, the frequency curves are on, the way they respond, the transformer. You know, I think it's the closest thing to a Helios that anybody's ever going to get next to a real Helios. Those are not that easy to find. Are the Helios EQs, are they inductor-based? The high is um, not an inductor, but the mid and the low is all inductor. So... Yes. What do you feel with the characteristics of those that make them different? I like inductor EQs in general. I just think they have a smoother, less phase shifty, less mechanical, less electronic kind of sound. You know, the Helios EQ is a really, I would say it's a unique equalizer. Like the points and the way that it works, it just seems tailored to like rock and roll music, you know, like 700 hertz on an electric guitar is just amazing you know and the low end is just great the 60 and the 100 are just great on drums I mean, you put it on like a like a two mix and you're just kind of like oh that's kind of aggressive and weird but then you throw like oh, a snare drum through one of them and you start EQing it and you're like wow i can really dig this out without changing it and making it sound equalized you know that's just kind of the helios thing i have um you know we were talking about a second ago about the data mix mic priest i also have a little sidecar Cadac from 72 oh, those are great. And it has the G320s in it. You know those? Yeah. Is that the first first series, like the really early ones? Really early ones, yes. Early 70s. This one's from Pi Studios. They had them at Pi. They had them at Wessex. And, of course, they had them at Monmouthshire. And it's it's the console that Bohemian Rhapsody was cut off. Yeah, they're really good. And as far as I know, the guy that I had recap it told me they're inductor-based as well. And I, you got little round things in there, yeah. Those are amazing desks. I know Jonathan Wilson has one. And yeah, John, I have the sidecar to his console. So Jonathan has, his is from... His is not from, let him know. He might want it back. No, no, no we, we bonded over it and talked about it. So he has he has the main console, and there's photos of the main console with the sidecar off to the side. 
and that's my console. And my, mine had been modded in 76 to be a quad console. So it's got front left, um, front right, back left, back right controls on it, which is great because now it's like a four bus. But I added direct outs on it as well so I can come off all 12 channels because it's a 12-channel console. Yeah, those things are great. Yeah, it's kind of a little secret. I guess they made a speaker system too back in the... I don't know if Wessex had it. One of those studios, I, I don't know who I was reading, maybe in the Ken Scott autobiography, he was talking about one of the studios had CADEC monitors that were just the greatest thing he ever heard. They were big mains. I don't know. I've never seen them, never heard anything about it. It could be a unicorn. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a couple of those companies of that time, isn't it? There's a CADEC and CalREC that were just making unbelievable stuff. I have eight CalREC modules over in my rack that are the earliest, early ones, the PQ50. 14s and 15s. Those are all inductor based, mid range and low. They're kind of nice. They're like a little between Neve and Helios. They're dirty, harmonic distortion, but just big and open and really smooth on the on the top end. So I had a pair of PQ 1061s for years that were just so good. I've never seen a board that has those modules in it. Like I've always wanted to see like what a big board with all PQ, you know, 1161s, whatever they're called in it, or the PQ 14s and 15s. I mean, I think those were all just broadcasts. They were, yeah. I got mine from the BBC in sort of late 90s when nobody cared. My first big console I ever bought was a CalRAC from the 80s. It was an M series. So it was basically, remember the UA8000, which was their answer to the SSL? Yeah. It was basically like a small version of that. It had the same equalizer and preamp, but a much smaller routing module section. It was like 32 or 28 input. It was phenomenal. Built like a tank, sounded great. Preamps were a little small on it, but the, the line section was great. But it was that era when AMS owned it. All those like switches over the course of the years just started going bad and they're unobtainable. I love the techie, uh, the tech thing. Um, can I repair this? Sort of. Why not? Because it's full of unobtainium. <laughs> it is. At the switches you can't get. You're going to spend 10 grand if you do find them. You know? so, I think so. you should redo the G320s because if you if you did your G320s, it's Bohemian Rhapsody. It's the sound of, uh, you know I mean? It's such a big selling point to talk about that. There's something about the way that these sound where, and maybe it's the inductor-based EQ, I don't know, where everything just sounds really forward. Like the Helios has that same thing. Tom's going through this immediately sound like Roger Taylor. They just go... <laughs> They just seem to be really up front. I guess that's another set of modules you're going to have to let me borrow on top of the data mix ones, right? Sure. You have to, keep, you have to send me all this gear to evaluate. Be careful, man. Your whole studio is going to end up over here. <laughs> I just like, you know, I'm just fascinated by a period of record making from like, because of course, everybody's obsessed with the 60s don't, and don't get me wrong and I get it. But I'm obsessed from like mid 70s to mid 80s. Because to me, it was like the sort of pinnacle because you had all the best of the 70s. But, you, you know, it was like mixed on it, mixed on SSLs. A lot of it was actually tracked on SSLs as well when they first came in. But like, yeah, the Helios, the Cadax, the Calrex. Um, and then, of course, the New York stuff like the Datamix and the Spectrasonics. And Don't forget the Trident A and B range yep. modules. You know, that's another big one. I, lo I love the Trident stuff. I just think it's everybody knows about it, don't they? It's... Uh, Nobody, we only guys like you and I talk about Kadak and even Calrec. But everybody, I mean, I love, you know, Jeff did an amazing job with those ori original um, um, A range pre's he did. They sound phenomenal. I used to have a pair of the vertical ones, um, which I borrowed from Hunter, Hunter Crowley, and I think he still has them. He won't sell them to me. And those are some of the best vocals I ever recorded. I have some of those as well, too. I just, haven't racked them up. If you don't need them, you can send them my way. Why don't, why don't I send you a pair of the data mixes for you to evaluate and you can send me a pair of those in the meantime? Well, they're not in a two-pair rack, though. That's the only problem. You know? right. They're in like, I got eight of them in a big rack. So it's like, they are good. I was going to sell them and Dave Cobb was trying to, he called me and he's like, you got, you going to sell those? I'm like, yeah, I don't know, maybe. He, he talked me out of it. He's like, you know, I normally don't do this, bro. He's like, but you'll never get those again. Why would you sell them? You'd sell them. I'm like, all right, I won't sell them. They are pretty special. I don't know what he did. I love Jeff. He's like a he's like the most understated, doesn't market himself at all kind of guy. Yeah, I've never met him. I mean, you gotta think, you know, like sound techniques and helios, those are technically could be the first two mass produced mixing desks in the world, if you think about it. Because at a point in the mid sixties, you had to hire an engineer to build a desk if you wanted to open a recording studio. You just couldn't buy one from vintage king you know the stories i got out of mike mclean when he was building motown was like oh yeah you know we had to make a tape machine so we just we made it you know we we would buy the 
transport function from Ampex and we made everything else in house, all the electronics, all the modules, everything. We built it and we just connected it to the Ampex. And I'm like, really? You know, like, you just couldn't buy the whole thing from Ampex and save yourself some time, you know, but they did it all. All the little desks they had were all built in house. So that's kind of what it was, you know. That's amazing. Yeah. So you're sitting there as a band or a producer, you know, think choosing where you want to work to get a sound. Yeah. I think the Helios thing kind of took over in England after a while there, though, because it seemed like everybody had a Helios desk after a while, you know. So you're doing all these incredible pieces of equipment. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, of course, is the fact that you are actually a, well, I can tell you're a studio owner because you're sitting in a studio in front of an API legacy. But, you know, you, uh, wait there, did you, did you win a Grammy? I did win a Grammy. You won a Grammy. What did you win a Grammy for, Mr. Al Sutton? For the um, Greta Van Fleet record from the Fires record, their first release, Best Rock. It was a while ago. It was like 2018 was the release of the album, but the Grammy came in like 19. So it's humbling to win that, but it's not like, why do it? You know? How did that come about, that record? Those guys, um, they're from here, obviously, from Michigan. They're like about an hour and a half north. They were these young kids that were playing in that area. They call it the Tri-Cities area, like Midden, Saginaw, and Bay City. And there's some rough little biker bars up there. And they were up there just doing covers and stuff. And this person that was trying to manage them, who managed some blues guys, said, they told them that you got to work with this guy in Detroit because he's the only guy, that, if you're going to do rock, he's the rock guy, you know? And he called me up and he, he made the introduction. He never really manage them. We just made the introduction. And then you know, they came in and at the time, like the twin brothers, I think were only 16 and the drummer and the bass player were like 13 or something. So they came in and it was just, you know, one of those moments where you're like, oh, another session, let's just see what it is. A bunch of young kids that want to play rock and they start playing. And I'm just like, my eyes just open up. I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, like, this is kind of good. So did the first EP pretty much, you know, in the first week of you know, which became half of the From the Fires record. And then you know, I called my, I have a business partner that I do production with, Marlon Young. He's he's a producer and phenomenal guitar player, plays guitar for Kid Rock sometimes when they're playing out live. And then he writes a lot of songs. And I go, Marlon, you got to hear this band. He's like, what do you got? I'm like, I'm going to just email you these tracks. And like literally like a minute later, he calls me back. And he's like, Are you, what? Like, what, what the fuck is this? I'm like, who, what? So... We sent it right to my lawyer who sends it to Jason Flom. And we pretty much had a deal sight unseen, just like that. Like, it's one of those, you know, you're finding a winning lottery ticket deal. You know, like a band comes into your studio and within like a few months, they have a deal on a major label. Yeah, because it's refreshing to hear kids doing music that we love. Because it's great for guys like you and I to go out and play some classic rock. But, you know, we're just reliving our youth. But they're rediscovering it. You know, it's like they come from like the real roots of it, though. You know, they weren't like a bunch of fashionable kids or like, let's just figure out what nobody's doing. They actually came up through that whole channel of listening to old blues music. And their father was like a blues musician. And that's what they grew up as little, you know, because three of them are brothers. So everybody pretty much knows the story on those guys. And th those three brothers just basically grew up listening to old blues music. So it's like their vocabulary on that type of music is really really deep you know you can really have a conversation about some really obscure blues artists and songs and stuff and they can really have it with you you know and they they, they know it between them being you know brothers and just being musicians together since they were four years old and then just their whole you know history and their learning and what they learned about music i think it all it just makes it a little more honest so did you record it at the studio you're in the moment i did yeah i did it all here and mixed it all here and then we did the full length that was done. We tracked it at Blackbird, you know, finished the overdubs here. Hey, I'll work on the knee room, but we couldn't get that room. I think Cheryl Crow is in that room. By the time we got to that second record or the first full length, it was like they were had such a busy tour schedule by then that it was more difficult to line up like two 10 day blocks to get them in to record their management's based out of Nashville. So it just, it made sense to call John up and just get the room over there and track, you know, on some open dates around the schedule. That's great. I've had that same experience working with an artist that is got like two days off in Nashville and boom, you're in there taking it's the tough, opportunity. Yeah. It's, it's tough to do that. You know, like you're, you're really hustling on it, you know? Yeah. Anything else you want to touch on? I mean, I could talk about gear all day. I love gear. You know? it's like, I have a ton of it. I like making it. I'm excited about this Helios thing. Cause I think that with this new format, I, I got a few other products, you know, that 
I want to put into that format. And like I said, the Flickinger, you know, Bill Skibby at Skibby Electronics is going to just put these Flickinger modules in there. And um, it's funny you say that you should do those data mix because I was actually thinking about doing CalRec modules as well down the road. You know, we, we not supposed to fit in my thing, you know? So, I mean, the data mix might even be cooler. You know, I find it funny too, because we just sit in the shop all day and we just get records out and we listen to music and we, you know, we're making gear. We spend all day just listening to stuff. And we were like looking for my reason we got on the first Dire Straits record. And that record was made at the same studio during the same year that like the Clash was making their first record at that same room. And you're just like, dude, think about the situation there. You got Dire Straits making a record and you got the Clash, you know, and they're both of their debut records. How how different could that be for a music scene? You know, that was just it's just fascinating to think of it. It's interesting because the engineers on those records were the same engineers. You know, you got you yeah. got Bill Price, Bill Price like doing late sixties work in a Decca all the way through the seventies, making like prog albums and all kinds of crazy stuff. And the next minute, he's making, you know, he's making London Calling. He's doing uh, the Pretenders' first record. You, you know, just badass. And as well, those records sound so good. They do. They're that that pinnacle of like just the sound, you know, I don't even know what you would call it. You know, it's just, just, I mean, it's just a moment too. It's, you know, and I've had friends, you know, I have friends that like own retail stores here in Detroit and they, you know, closed stores were young kids shop and they would play it. And, you know, people would be like, what is this band? And they're like, Oh, it's this young band. And they're like, yeah, it reminds me of Led Zeppelin. And he'd be like, who's Led Zeppelin? You know, like they wouldn't know, and, you know, these young kids and they wouldn't even know who Led Zeppelin was. So, I don't know. You know, the way I kind of look at it is I stopped trying to figure out what people really want to hear or what the record company wants to sign. And I just try to just make music that I just enjoy and I feel is good, you know, and if I enjoy it doesn't mean it's going to be a hit, you know, or successful, but at least it's nice to listen to. You know, I kind of given up on that a long time ago. Of like, we got to find another band that's going to be the next whatever, insert the name of the most popular band right now. You know, because you never get anywhere doing that. You spin your wheels for years doing that. So honesty in music definitely shines through in in all ways, regardless of what kind of music it is. If somebody's playing something that's truly from their heart, you know. So uh, what are you what are you working on next? I got this young band from here in Detroit called Max Saturn that I'm trying to work with a little bit, and um, they got this amazing singer, and it's kind of got this like Rolling Stonesy meets like Jay Giles kind of vibe, you know, like rock and roll, but they think they're a soul band, but they're really a rock band type of thing, you know. Like I got that going, you know, finishing up vocals, and then I'm gonna start mixing it and just tightening it up, and that's the next thing I gotta finish. And then there's another band called Pharaohs that it's one of the guys who works here steve he plays in a lot of bands too and he's really busy making records so he's kind of floating around a lot now he also plays with um joanne shaw taylor that british blues chick who plays guitar she's phenomenal he, he tours with her her u.s band so he's got this rock band together like i hooked all these him and these other guys up that i've worked with with other bands and they're working on a record too so two things i got right now and that's about all i can handle once i launch all this stuff this year i just want to like I said, try to get back into the studio more and make more records or use the gear that I've been designing you know, or building. So. Amazing. All right, I'm going to finish up with uh, with the, the dumb geeky questions. If if you only had like uh, like five pieces of equipment, essential pieces of equipment to make a record, what would those five things be? Putting you on the spot. Desert, I, I would, it would have to be an 87 or a 67, preferably a 67. The compressor would have to be a 32264 Neve or a 33609 because that's, I think that, if not that, an ADR Compex. Those two would be one of those two for the compression. The mic preamp, that's tough. I would say probably a Helios because I really like the way they sound, but I, you know, I have a lot of different preamps. So I think for the sake of shameless marketing, I would say a Helios. <laughs> All right. Well, you got you got. But you have to admit, a sixty-seven, a Helios, and a Neve compressor is pretty much yeah sums up seventies, you know, for a recording chain. That's a pretty fantastic one. What about dynamic? Would it just be a fifty-seven? Yeah, I would use, but I'd use the Unidyne three version of it, the silver early silver ones. They sound better than a fifty-seven. And then, are you still making, ever making records to tape? You know, I'm trying to. <laughs> I just bought a three M fifty-six. 
and I'm restoring it right now. And I had a 79 forever, but it needed new heads and it was really in rough shape. So I just sold it because I didn't want to spend the money on it. And I bought this 56 from United Sound actually. So it's in pretty damn good shape. So I'm just recapped it and I got to, you know, just get the mechanical parts of the transport all rebuilt and retuned. And I want to throw that in. And I will use that again, but, you know, it'll probably be for like clients that actually want to do it. You know, some people don't want to do it. They don't want to spend the money on the tape and they don't see the benefit of it. But, you know, I find like, you know, when you're doing a production project and you're working with, say, like a band you're trying to develop up, unless you spend all that time in pre-production to get the song worked out, you know, the tape thing is kind of a hard thing to go at, you know, because you're end up in Pro Tools anyways, editing and rearranging. And I think a band like Greta, I could do tape with them, on, you know, on their next record, if I do the next record. They seem to work it out and they play so well as a live unit. So, you know, I look at the tape thing as a per band basis thing, you know, who could, who's ready for it and who's not, you know. Hi, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that. Please leave any comments and questions below. Um, thanks, Al, for giving us your time and... Uh, Excited to trek out the Motown DI tube version, which I'm hoping I will get anytime soon. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. So long, farewell, Vida Zay, and au revoir. Tschüss. Goodbye. <laughs>